Um, hi, so hello, I'm Shine, and on behalf of Peace Vigil, I'm very happy to welcome you to the webinar and analysis of the Indian education system, past, present, and future. We're also delighted to have with us today our incredible resource person, Professor Anita Rampal. Thank you, Professor Rampal, for sharing your knowledge with us today. We'll be introducing Professor Rampal shortly. Before we do that, this is to remind everyone that as a peace education organization, we encourage questions. Please feel free to use the chat function to ask them. Also, if you have friends who could not join Zoom, this webinar is been, being transmitted live on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. Both Facebook page and the YouTube channel are called Peace Vigil and you can identify it by our logo, which is a vigilant eye with the words, peace needs all of us. Um, you can see it here on the slide as well. I now hand over the platform to my colleague, Samir Dosani, to introduce and invite our esteemed guest, Professor Anita Rampal. Over to you, Samir. Thank you so much, Shine. Um, and happy Teacher's Day to all. Uh, it's my honor to introduce our guest today. Professor Anita Rampal was the Dean at the Faculty of Education, Delhi University. She is an EC member of the International Commission on Mathematics Instruction and a joint coordinator of uh, a project on education for sustainable development. She was a Nehru Fellow, a UGC research scientist, director of the Nat National Literacy Center, at the LBS National Academy of Administration, Masuri, and was involved with the National Curriculum Framework in 2005. She was also the chairperson of the NCERT, Primary Textbook Development Teams, and has been associated with national policymaking, educational initiatives uh, at the state level, the People's Science Movement, the Right to Education, and the National Liter Literacy Campaigns. Uh, Professor Rampal works in the areas of policy analysis, curriculum studies, science technology society studies, and has produced films on women and participatory development. Uh, we are so happy that Professor Rampal is here with us today to talk about the Indian education system and the subject of education in general. This webinar um, will be in interview format, as Shine has mentioned, and you're welcome to send in your questions, and we will address those questions towards the end. I would now like to invite my colleague Shirin to begin the conversation with Professor Rampal. And Professor Rampal, if you could also turn on your, your, uh, your video. So hi everyone again. Um, thank you, Samir. And Professor Anita Rampal, a very happy Teacher's Day to you. Thank you. Uh, once again, friends, uh, if you want to ask questions, friends who are on Facebook and YouTube, you will have to log in uh, Zoom. Uh, we do not have the facility to answer questions on three different um, platforms. Um, so we begin now the interview. Uh, we are all aware of the importance of education, both to an individual and to the society. Uh, Professor Rampal, in your long and distinguished journey as an educationist, how much importance does access to education have? And I'd like to clarify this with a couple of examples. The right to education is a great thing to have, but if a child lives in a village too far from any school or it is unsafe for a child to go to school, what meaning does the right to education have then? Similarly, a child may have access to a high school in this area, in his area, but that school has no facilities, uh, no teachers, not enough teachers. So he does have access to a school, but the school does not have enough resources that are needed to run it efficiently. So what are some of the main hurdles that people face in India to get their right to education? And how much have governments done and how much is the present government doing to make the right to education a reality. Okay. Um, first, 
happy that we'll be having this dialogue across continents, hopefully. But uh, I would like to share that a right to education is different from the language which talks about access. For our constitution in 1950, soon after independence, uh, India became independent in uh, 47. And in the debates about what kind of a constitution and what kind of franchise, should everyone have the right to vote? Because many countries have not had that. In fact, uh, there are countries when the education level and uh, the fact that a person had property, these two qualifications then allowed a person to be able to go and vote. And we know that gender was an issue. Many countries, women didn't have a right to vote. So what was significant is that there was a commitment in our sort of founding uh, visionaries uh, who were looking at this independent country, this diverse, very disparate country with uh, just about 10% literacy levels at that time. So when the question was asked that, you know, what will we do with such a large number of new literate voters, uh, this was uh, like a commitment to the constitution being a pedagogical project. So unlike some other constitutions, which are more about governance and, you know, norm setting, this was a transformative constitution, which said, we know where we are. We know the difficulties, we know the challenges, the inequities, but through the constitution and through the fact that people will be voting, every person will cast a vote and that will help people to live together because you'll have to understand others too. You won't be just bulldozed by someone and you know told to vote for uh, the hierarchical chief or something. And that was meant to be a process Along with that, because everyone did have a right to vote, it was promised that in 10 years, everyone will have free and compulsory education. So democracy, the right to vote and education were tied in the transformative vision, which was a founding moment for our country. But 70 years after the constitution had promised this, uh, by 2010, uh, many of us, huge numbers of people working on the ground for education realized that that was not the case. Every 10 years, the target would just keep going further because this was a directive principle. It said the state shall endeavor to provide, but endeavor to provide free and compulsory education by itself is nothing, as you just said. So it's not a question of access. So in a very historic Right to Education Act, which came as late as 2010. And that's the difference. It's not a language of access. It's a fundamental right, which means that the child has to have, it's an entitlement for a child, and it clarifies that it's good quality education. It clarifies that it's admission, attendance, and completion of elementary education, which is at the age of 14. So this is six to 14 years, which is what the right to education is. And the hope was that once this is implemented, then the state will go on to extend the right to education from age three to age 18. But unfortunately, today, uh, 10 years after the right to education was being implemented, we find that yes, enrollments have gone up. In fact, the enrollments uh, the demand for school education was going up even when many of us were involved in the national literacy campaigns, which was for adults and youth. But what happened was that, and that was a, a very participatory campaign, uh, which was not bureaucratic, which was really in terms of an abhiyan, you know, in which people join in and the community, it was decentralized for the first time in the history of education. Everything was planned, materials, primers, everything prepared at the district level, not at the state level. And in languages that were really the languages of people. So uh, that was crucial. And from that, you know, when people, adults sort of came into these classes and the classes were engaged with issues of life. It was not just looking at an alphabet or trying to read, uh, you know, some uh, very truncated sentence as normally happens in a primer, written in a condescending fashion. It was not that, and uh, that was more like a critical pedagogy approach of Paulo Freire, which came into our national campaign. And from that time, the demand for schooling really showed up. 
children started coming into school. But when parents got involved in this, they realized that, you know, this was going to be a change in their children's lives. But this was not followed up. Today, if we see, they're just about 12, 13% of our schools, which we can say are compliant with the right to education. Now, the right to education was also telling the government that uh, uh, what kind of a teacher is going to be a qualified teacher because the government itself was compromising on quality and the poorest would get the poorest school, you know, and the teacher would be a contractual, poorly paid, maybe not even qualified. And so, you know, that was happening. And that's why our struggle became really strong at the time when India economically was really strong. So the question was that if India is doing well, its GDP is rising, then this is one commitment which India cannot forego. And uh, so uh, luckily, with, a, with a reluctant governments, because governments are never very, very keen to start investing in areas that, you know, the middle classes had always uh, taken, uh, sort of used education as a stepping stone for their purposes, then demanded good higher education institutions. So good IITs, Institute of Technology, management, you know, so our earlier education secretaries used to say that, that it's actually the middle classes which have said that why waste funds on the poor? They, what will they do with education? You know, this was the feeling generally that this hierarchical hegemonic feeling that, well, you know, they are just going to be selling something or working on the farms. So they don't really need education, but that thinking continues even today. And that's the challenge in our society that that thinking those of us who are privileged, you wouldn't believe it, the children, I mean, our, our research with 13-year-old children in Delhi, in, in elite privileged schools, children are saying it with such audacity that it shocks me because they're saying, why waste money? Why should the government waste money on education for poor children? Teach them how to do leather work, teach them how to make do cooking somewhere in a, in a small hotel. What will they do with our books of science and mathematics? Can you believe it? 12 year old children talking about that. So what is this democracy that we have been able to carve out of the, the really very inspiring vision that we find in our constitution or we find in our earlier policy documents, which looked at education as the only major way which can bring equity. Uh, in, in education and bring equity, having a democratic education, which can bring equity in society. Professor Rampal, how much of um, this has to be seen in relation um, to the availability of private schools to the rich? Because, you know, if there were no private schools, the children of the affluent would have to go to government schools, which would then push for the government to put in more resources in government schools. The thing is that, you know, when you have, it's across the world, when you invest and develop an equitable, good public education system, automatically people come into this and don't really opt for private schools, except for maybe just a couple of, you know, elite uh, institutions which exist and people who want to segregate their children, uh, send them there. But uh, our own policy, there's our last education commission, which was in 64, 66, actually said this, that equity is tied to quality. If you think that you can buy quality by sending your children into a private school, please remember that that is tainted quality, you know, because that is segregating your child in a very isolated, very privileged environment is depriving your child of even understanding the social realities around your child. And uh, that is not going to be really a good education in the long run for your child. So that was the thinking that came in and which looked at education being one forum which can carve and forge a platform when people from very disparate backgrounds can come in. And even today, one form of our government schools the Kendriya Vidyalaya, you know, which are called the central schools, which are actually meant for government, people working in government. But about 10% of schools also go to the poor who may not be really from the government. There we find uh, they're very well resourced schools. We find they're in great demand and there we find there's still a lot of mixing, you know, uh, of people coming from different 
brackets different uh, socioeconomic status. Uh, so if you provide a well-resourced school, and we've seen that, I mean, if school functions well and it's exciting, you have a good qualified teacher. Even today, I was just uh, a couple of hours back, I was having a webinar and because on Teacher's Day, there was a discussion with the minister and with the panchayats, which is the local self-government in Kerala. And we had a two-hour meeting when the local self-governments, the panchayats was, were telling us what is it that they're doing in education. And even there we find, they were telling us that in one year, 5% of enrollments have gone up when their school system has really improved and it's, it's doing many more innovative things. It's going beyond just the textbook. Uh, they have found that uh, children jump from the private schools onto this school when the public system is good. And we've also seen that. I mean, we've seen it in between states, you know, when there was a very good functioning school in a state uh, uh, like Rajasthan, we could see children running across the borders of a state and coming here. So nothing can stop you if you really have a good, inviting, challenging, uh, creative space for children. And even our Supreme Court, the highest uh, legal uh, uh, judiciary body, has said they have ordered a midday meal for every child from uh, up to age 14. Uh, and they have said when uh, someone questioned them, it's difficult, how do you serve it, where do you cook it? They said this is not just for nutrition, even though half our children today are undernourished, severely uh, undernourished. But the Supreme Court said this is more than nutrition. It is to strengthen the social fabric of democracy because our children don't even get a place to be eating together irrespective of religion and caste. You know, so that is the state of even in 20th century, 21st century India, where children are not getting these spaces. So yeah. that's how the courts or that's how these uh, the education system and such a platform becomes important if we think our society must, must maintain the pillars of democracy that we have really, uh, and, you know, embraced. One thing you said is that there are very few schools that actually comply uh, when it comes to the government directions as to you know what schools should have and uh, you gave a percentage that was rather low what was it sorry could you remind us please yeah. about 13 percent okay so that, that's, that's all yeah so that is very low the other thing that you mentioned is that uh, you know it's also a question of uh, social interaction things like the midday meal which, which many schools cannot provide. Now, one of the factors that prevents uh, kids from um, socializing with other kids is caste and religion. And in India, those two are pretty big. Uh, some of the other things that may prevent kids from interacting is also, you know, the gender stereotypes that we have in the Indian society, not just in Indian society, but because we are talking of India. So what are these, some of the factors that you as an educationist see um, as hurdles, you know, that where the state must intervene. It's not just up to, uh, you know, individuals, but the state must intervene to, uh, to fight those kind of um, uh, things that exist in society, whether it is caste or, uh, you know, communal divides or gender divides, or even the urban rural divide. Yes, uh, like I was, uh... I must say that it's not, I'm not saying that midday meal schools can't provide, the government does provide. Mm. And that's under a Supreme Court order. So that's a serious thing. And uh, so that is something which children do get and it's important. But uh, I'm saying that uh, the fact that having right now our public education system is highly stratified. Even in Delhi, there are about seven kinds of government schools. The, really well resourced, uh, where the teachers are very well qualified, and then uh, something which uh, something else which uh, uh, is called the Pratibha Vikas, which means those schools which actually are made for trying to develop talent of children. Now, we don't understand why only few schools should be developing to children's talent. So, you know, these are the kinds of systems which have been built in into uh, uh, even a public education system, which is stratified and which then expects a child to get 
at grade six, at least 60% marks to be then qualifying to come into this better resource school. Now, these are some things that we've been really struggling against, and that's what the right to education was. It said you cannot screen a child at all. A government or a private school will not take an interview, will not screen them, will not have interviews with parents because that's what schools do, private schools especially. Elite schools try to find out what is the father's salary or whether the mother can speak English and you know, etc. So it said any form of profiling of the child or screening is going to run into a heavy penalty. So these were kinds of steps that the right to education took. And it said that at least 20%, 25% of the seats will be kept for economically weaker section uh, or children with disabilities, you know, is the challenged children. So that not just to say that the poor children will get a chance to come into a rich school, no. So that the rich children will get a chance to study with children from ordinary backgrounds. Hmm. That is the understanding why this uh, caveat was kept. In fact, legally it was discussed, should we have 50% of this? Should we say 50% from economically weaker section to be studying in any private school? Mm. But, you know, we know that our private schools had even had spent, had, uh, you know, really employed very expensive lawyers to fight that clause. And we've heard very eminent schools, well-known schools where principals actually said that, you know, I can't uh, sit like a director and face my own domestic help coming in as a parent. Oh. So you can see what society is today. Society is getting much more into cocoons, much more conscious, much more segregated. I mean, we as children may have played across our socioeconomic status in the public park outside, on the streets outside. Today, you don't find children playing on the streets. You so find only the poor children on the streets. So, you know, this kind of separating out class-wise, being conscious of language. I mean, today it's shocking that children are told not to speak any other language except English. And there are schools which penalize children if they speak their own language or they speak Hindi. So how, if you can't even speak the language of, of your area, of the people around you, you are just, and this is what our so-called global schools try to do. You know, we have some schools which, which sort of brand themselves as global schools, which are producing global citizens. And we have critiqued the way they, uh, the philosophy they follow, which is a completely segregationist, it's almost like an apartheid. You know, that is what we say, that it's an apartheid which, in which the rich are trying to block out their children from any other child, from the life of anyone on there. And then if these people go into policy making, what do they know about our country? What policies will they make? Mm -hmm. So our current policy today is again threatening to do this kind of a, a high segregation you know, is again threatening to create more hierarchies. There are already hierarchies, and True. this policy does not even mention a Dalit child, does not even have the name Dalit in a policy, mm. does not mention what a Muslim child is going through today in our highly divisive atmosphere, highly divisive atmosphere yeah. where, uh, you know, people feel threatened, people are uh, persecuted, people are pointed fingers at, their food is made fun of, you know, so, I mean, instead of breaking these divisive uh, barriers, trying to make, trying to create empathy through education, that was our challenge last all these years, even in the curriculum, and I can show you some examples of textbooks that uh, chapters that uh, we were using, where for us, it was important, even if we talk of food, it is not talking of only carbohydrates or proteins. It is talking of food as a cultural context. Mm. Our syllabus used to ask, even in grade three, uh, do you think any of these is food and any of these was red ants or uh, the nest of a, a bird or something like that? And in fact, all of those were food for someone or the other. But the fact is that our children, our urban children, to which mostly our textbooks are addressing to their lives, you know, they tend to say, oh, well, this is my yum food and that is yuck. So it's not just that. Even today, the divisiveness between religion is actually creating mob lynchings of a Muslim just because you feel that this person may be eating beef or maybe transporting uh, uh, beef or transporting buffalo meat. I mean, the fact that you feel you can actually lynch a person to death 
just because of the food a person eats is extremely serious and uh, for us most alarming and these are the kinds of questions that we were addressing through education and you know saying that uh, 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 in this area it's this child's uh, favorite food is fr fried termites or uh, ants red ants is considered very high in vitamin a and eaten across different states by people so you know i'm saying that even something you know it's not enough just to say diversity we all wear different clothes we sing different songs we parade on the republic day in the fancy dress it's not that we have to look at uh, what are the differences by differences i mean even uh, the the differences which may be harsh realities which may be uncomfortable to understand but empathy means that and peace means that and uh, this is something that uh, we, uh, an education system will really need to work i mean just like in germany they take they absolutely it's a part of their school philosophy that every child has to understand what holocaust was you can't sort of put this behind the curtain teachers must must understand this so that it doesn't happen again and even the museum of holocaust i mean when i've been to countries like that i've been to south africa and gone to the museum of apartheid just to understand what is it and how do we uh, not forget these things you know so that the younger generations get socialized as part of education to realize what does racism mean or what did it mean to be a black child and uh, but in our case we find that there is this attempt to completely gloss over these things and that is what is happening much more right now with this right wing government which is now i mean everything uh, as we we use critical pedagogy and critical pedagogy is not just asking critical questions it is a premised on justice just how do even if you're doing mathematics how do you take social justice to be an important premise on which you work whatever you're teaching in mathematics whatever you're teaching in uh, in language that was our basis for our new textbooks our national textbooks since 2005 but right now we find that uh, if we if even a ch if children are asked why were these riots why do you think the sick riots happened in delhi and what do we feel about that or i mean i can show you a chapter where we are asking uh, about uh, uh, um, uh, there is a, a chapter in in which uh, human beings are going into the gutters because that's how even today our sewage our sewers are cleaned despite all the laws which says that you know you shouldn't have humans doing that but you have that and these are people from the lowest caste then these are what were have been called untouchables or dalits and even in government i mean they are in government jobs they are in government departments to be doing that job so we have it for a class for child photographs of people emerging out of the gutter and saying who would want to do this work you know and why do you think they are doing this work and then asking young children showing them a painting and showing them different kinds of jobs and instead of the very traditional uh, you know status quo way of being a child what do you think a postman does and who does what is a doctor's job and no we ask them to look for these different tasks and what are the five tasks that you would like to do and which are the five you wouldn't like to do and this is what you start with a young child an age 9 year old child and this is how you talk about justice because children do understand that when they're given an opportunity to talk of this from their lives and many of them reading these books are from those lives so professor rampal what you have been involved in is in a way a transformation of society through education because we obviously have so many things that we need to fight and schools are the best places to to begin that you know where where young kids are coming in and you start that and you started that way back so you know the right to education came quite late uh, you know relatively speaking but you have been working on these issues for a long time in fact i want to mention something which is called critical thinking it's a buzzword these days everyone's talking about it but what you have just mentioned is really uh, the crux of that critical thinking because critical thinking you know it's not just about problem solving it's about uh, at the end of the day analyzing the society you're talking uh, you're talking about justice you know understanding where there's injustice 
you know, what is my role in it? Can I do something uh, to, to end that and so on? And in that context, I would like to know your views um, about the new education policy, both in terms of content and also in terms of how it is taking the idea of uh, education for everyone forward. You know, did we really need a new education policy? Did we not have all the things we needed, you know, in the constitution and in the previous attempts to provide education? So uh, we would like to know those in detail. There are a lot of questions here that relate to the new education policy in the chat. So please go ahead, you know, take your time and explain. <laughs> Did you also ask those questions? Okay, sure. Uh, tell sure. me when I, I, I can I, share screen. Yes, please share screen. When can I share? So I'll just show you one or two examples before I go ahead. Yeah, can I do that? Yes, please, absolutely. Let me make you the the host here, uh, and you can share your screen. There is um, the the chat function uh, here has a lot of things on it but I will only read the things that are about new education policy right now. Um, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Rampal, they're kind of overlapping. So I think all of them are trying to ask uh, the similar stuff. So I think, I think you know, we can just go ahead and um, tackle okay. that, yes. I just uh, sh uh, show two, three pages, just pages to give you an example of what I meant when I was saying, uh, education for empathy, a pedagogy, a critical pedagogy uh, with the youngest child and uh, for peace. What does this mean for compassion? So this is, uh, I would leave it to you to, to guess what subject this is from. If you can read the slide, uh, it's called the junk seller. And uh, this is a true story. It's a true example of this woman. And there's a board behind her which uh, says Kiran or uh, um, uh, her mother Sumitra ki kabadi ki dukan, which is a junk shop. Uh, one, I, uh, I must tell you, and this is in Patna. So I must tell you that there are hardly any women who run junk shops. So this is something that, uh, you know, a woman has really gone out and is defying uh, gender roles in a big way. Uh, she says in her story, she says that when I wanted to, uh, she said, when I was young, my father died in an accident. My mother worked as a servant in some houses. We had a difficult time. I had to leave school after class eight. And she says that um, I studied in Hindi and I hated maths. And, uh, you know, today that helps me a lot in the work that I do. And uh, she uh, now is telling us that when she wanted to do some work, she went around trying to do a recce. Uh, you know, like an entrepreneur, what is it that I should be doing? Someone said you open a beauty parlor, someone said you do something. And then uh, her uncle decided, said in this area, we don't have a junk shop. Why don't you do that? There are others who sort of told her junk shop, that's the lowest of the lowest jobs that you can do. It's dirty work. How can you think of doing that? But she went ahead. She got a loan in the name of her mother-in-law and herself, which is extremely rare. She's she belongs to a state which is extremely feudal. And uh, so in that state in Patna, which is the capital city of Bihar, she runs a shop. And by giving her, uh, this is a mathematics chapter. And by giving her true story as a chapter in a, in a grade four mathematics book, not only do we give agency uh, and representation to children who belong to uh, such families, such work, which is considered dirty work. But uh, she met me after a year and she told me that hundreds of people were coming to her shop just to see her because now she's a textbook heroine. You know, so it was also to give people uh, that agency of, you know, you can be a heroine. For us, these were the leaders that we wanted. These are the protagonists of our textbooks. We don't have political leaders. We don't have normally what happens, you know, in textbooks, you have all these historical readers. So in the primary school, we don't have that. And even when we have Gandhi, it is not Gandhi, but it's a child from his ashram who is talking. And I'll just show you that chapter. So, um, so this is, uh, 
I think I'll have to stop screen sharing to go to the next one. Um, uh, um, Professor, you can just uh, click on the next one on the left. I can see number two. Uh, you know where, no, you don't have to stop sharing. It uh, says screen sharing has stopped. Uh, okay. One second. But you can, you can do it. You are still the host. Um, Professor Rampal, you know, if you go back to screen sharing on, on the left side, uh, yeah. you will see number two okay. slide that you have. Uh, yeah. Okay. Please let me know if yeah. I can help in any way. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, a chapter again, which is one of our most, I mean, you know, some chapters were really a challenge. Uh, can you read? This is called Sunita's Experience of Living in Space. Now, this is a chapter I'm just showing you of an idea, like a concept, which is normally so abstract and difficult for young children, but it's still taught and makes no sense to children. It makes very little sense even to teachers. And this is a concept of gravity. Uh, uh, and it's, it, it should be taught at a very young age, but this is grade five. So this is about 11 year, uh, uh, 12 year old children. And again, we are using a true life experience of Sunita Williams, uh, who is of Indian origin, who went into space, a very articulate person. She came to India, she visited schools, and she spoke beautifully. So we had got her pictures from the NASA website, and we also got her interviews, and we built a chapter around that. And uh, uh, so, you know, it's very difficult for even adults to understand, and in the history of even when we look at science in which how do adults understand gravity, uh, we know that it's a very counterintuitive subject because you, you're in, whenever you're on this earth, you never are without gravity. So you just assume what it is. And it's very difficult to understand that there is something that is being pulled towards the earth or you know things like that. Some force which you can't see, you can't really feel. Yeah. So uh, without using the term gravity, we are just using her real life experience. She's sitting there and uh, we have other photographs when they're eating food, which the food is floating around in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in their um, uh, spacecraft. And uh, she is saying that we could not sit at one place. We kept floating in the spaceship. Water too doesn't stay in one place. It floats around as blobs. So to wash our face, we had to catch these blobs and wet paper with them. Uh, we ate very differently. So, you know, she's talking, she said we had to catch the floating food packets. Now, when you use some real life experience and use language, which evokes a child's imagination. Now you have to really use that imagination. It's difficult to imagine what is gravity and what is life without gravity. So we use that. And we also used a, what I thought was the most striking thing of this example. And that struck me that, you know, I'm really going to use this fact. It says, in space, there was no need to use a comb. My hair kept standing all the time. Now, I use this for the question. When you look at the question, it says, can you think why Sunita's hair was standing? Now, our questions are always, can you say, can you think, what do you think is it about? It's not, what is gravity? What is a forest? You know, it's not that. So this is a constructivist approach where you're saying, the children have to make sense of something. How do you allow them to make sense? Uh, whether it's making sense of the most harsh realities of life or make sense of the most abstract concepts of life, which may be around them, and yet it's not easy to understand. So, you know, we do this and we say, look at Sunila's photographs and the dates written, and then, you know, tell us. So making them look at photographs, making them imagine, telling them to imagine that they've just woken up in, their, in a spacecraft and what is it that they can do? What are the next few things they'll do? Can they drink water? Can they brush their teeth? How will they brush their teeth? You know, just making them imagine. And that is how we've done this without using the word gravity. But the last part was very beautiful. Sunita Williams actually tells us uh, you know, she says that she used to look out of the spacecraft and she used to look at the earth, which she found so very beautiful. And we've given a photograph. And then she says, I used to wonder, I cannot see any lines from here. Who had made these lines between the countries? 
Now that again is such a beautiful philosophical just seed of a thought in a child's mind that there are no lines because you won't believe it but I have seen teachers young teachers who think that when you go from one state to the other you'll actually see a line of the kind that you see in a map you know I mean they, they're so it's, it's sort of etched into a, a person's mind that you know you find that they think that there are the kinds of lines that you'll actually see made on the ground and here she says who do you think made these lines how did these lines come about so we're using every opportunity in an integrated way this is a chapter which is on a very hardcore subject like science but we are using the idea of a woman's experience uh, what it meant to go into space and uh, how they were eating what they were doing there were people from different countries and then how she looks at this earth and what she thinks about it so um professor rampal i just want to one remind our, and just our, one more I just want to remind our viewers that Professor Rampal is talking about uh, these books that are for government schools. So, you know, that's very important. She works within the government school systems uh, or system rather. So it's very important to re remember that these books, these examples that she's showing us are from government books. These are not private. Uh, yeah. uh, national, uh, national textbooks national textbooks and uh, professor rampal i just want to quickly read a few questions so that you can integrate them into okay. the um, yeah. Uh, yeah it says right to education talks about the fundamental right of education for every individual what about disabled students they include in schools um and now npe uh, the new education policy to 2020 is this policy uh, what kind of initiatives does it talk about for disabled students and special educators and so on? The next question is, in the backdrop of NEP and the difficulties to resist it, does demanding for common school systems helps? And um, uh, there is another question, why do we see the uh, academicians shying away to raise up questions against the non-availability of common school systems? Dr. Rampal, what is your opinion on vocational training being, being recommended by NEP uh, in the society? So there are a lot of things coming up. Uh, Dr. Rampal, it's up to you how you want to take them. Okay, okay. So after I've just sort of briefly given you a feel of the kind of work that was happening in the last 15 years at least, some of us have been working in states much earlier and this comes out of all that work in the last 40 years or more uh, and uh, at least 45 years I can say that I've been on the you know while I've been doing research and other things I was also working on the field and uh, so this uh, was the way in which we were trying to bring together people's experiences in a critical pedagogy approach and an approach which said that uh, you children construct knowledge themselves. You don't have to give information. You have to give them opportunities to construct knowledge. And uh, this is again um, a chapter on the concept of time. And I'm trying to say how we tried uh, to make culturally responsive um, uh, pedagogy, which means that you're sensitive to understand uh, cultural context also in uh, mathematics, is considered uh, one uh, considered a killer subject we seem to have uh, lost uh, the connection with uh, professor rampal can people still hear her or is it just me who can't hear her could people please write in the chat function if they can hear professor rampal Um, there seems to be uh, some issue with uh, Professor Rampal's connection. We are just uh, uh, talking to her on the phone to figure out what happened. It seems like sh uh, her connection has dropped off completely. So we may have to figure that one out. In the meantime, um, I would like to tell our viewers here 
that um, as part of the series on education that we have started today on India's Teachers Day, the next webinar we have is on the 12th of uh, September and we will be discussing how the apartheid in South Africa impacted the education system here, what it did to people's lives, how it influenced um, the society. Um, and the speaker for that is Nadima Jogi. So uh, do watch out for that. Um, it is on the 12th of September. We will be sending out details in our newsletter so that you can uh, join. Unfortunately, uh, we still haven't uh, been able to reconnect with Professor Rampal. We are still trying. Um, if there is a, a person here who would like to uh, talk about their experiences as an educator or as a student, what are the changes they have seen in recent years uh, with the coming of a right-wing government in power, whether it, uh, it is in terms of content or access, we uh, welcome you to, to share your experiences with us. If there's anybody who'd like to um, share about what's happening in India at the moment or, or you know, what has happened in the last few years, the saffronization of education, so talking about content, but also in terms of systematic um, uh, uh, problems that, that are being faced, for instance, uh, the privatization of institutions and so on. Uh, yes, Susie, uh, we have your question here. I'm interested in the question of Manjula Kumar. Is the curriculum becoming more international uh, in the, as part of the Hindutva agenda? Or, or did you say, or the Hindutva agenda? I guess, uh, you know, we will have to wait for uh, uh, Professor Rampal to, to answer that. Um, she is writing back now, I think, is she? We don't really know what has happened. Delhi does have um, power, issue. power issues. Sometimes she was speaking from uh, Delhi. Uh, we do have a few people who would like to speak. We also have our um, in-house specialist, Samir Dosani, who works on education. Uh, he was previously with ActionAid International and also Oxfam International. And he could perhaps uh, talk about uh, the inequalities, um, you know, that are exacerbated because of the kind of education system that India has and how uh, coming of the right wing has worsened it, uh, but also of the um, philosophy uh, of teaching, you know, and of uh, education uh, that uh, some of us perhaps uh, do not know about. Uh, so I uh, invite Sami Dosani from Peace Vigil to talk. Thank you very much, uh, Shireen, and I do apologize for the um, for the difficulties. I just thought um, we're having such a great masterclass from Professor Rampal on um, on the work that she's been doing around trying to promote a certain paradigm of education within India, in, within India, and as she says, she's been doing that for more than forty five years. But I thought it would be useful to just take a moment to explain that there are several different paradigms at play when we talk about education in India. Now she's talking about, she's talked about the, the, um, the private sector 
uh, which she would know more than I would. But I'm going to talk a little bit uh, bigger picture about uh, what has been happening over the last, even the last century. So I think we can talk about a traditional view of education. It's not just an Indian view. I would call this even a colonial view of education, where you have uh, educational institutions. So let's say this is the pre-independence period. In, in, in educational institutions are almost by definition in such a worldview for the elites, right? So you have a uh, very few percentage of people who are going to go to university. Um, in the Indian case, it might be less than 10%. Um, in other contexts, it may be as much as 40%, but not much more than that. Even in Europe, you won't find more than that. So you find that the purpose of education is to train a certain elite group who then become the, uh, the power brokers, the politicians, the bankers, uh, whatever these sort of elite jobs are in the society. Um, and the, if, other, if you have a universal education policy, it is more about sort of childcare so that um, the parents of those people can attend work. So that's the traditional view. There's also a neoliberal view of education. Ah, Dr. Rampal is back. Sorry, um, Dr. Rampal, we lost you. Is everything okay now? Yes, I mean, the signal just went off, would connect and came back. Oh, great, great. No, I, I wasn't sure what to do. So I was doing a rundown of uh, traditional colonial education policy versus neoliberal yeah, good. policy. And then in the yeah. and then I was gonna get to Friari at the end. Uh, but you are back. So I will turn it over back to you and to Shini. So uh, Shini, are you ready? I am. I was just I think you can finish what you were doing. On, on the phone. I, I can, I mean, very briefly, if, you, if you'd like me to finish, Professor Rampal, just very briefly to say that there's that traditional elitist view of education. Um, then there is, I would say, a Nehruvian view of education, which, um, which in some ways echoed the colonial constructs. Um, but it tried to make things a little bit more universal. And the period in the 1950s and 1960s was really a period of investing in especially secondary and tertiary education systems and trying to create um, a certain kind of a specialized class within India who could do what Nehru specifically saw as the work of industrialization and development and so on. Uh, that paradigm came under pressure in the 1980s and 1990s when we have a more neoliberal agenda coming in, uh, in economic terms, in societal terms and so on. This idea that actually um, we are there, all people are there to be workers for companies who are there to make profits. It's a very capitalistic paradigm. And so in this view, the role of education is really to just turn out workers, right? So I'm doing a very abbreviated uh, version because now we have you back. Um, but to say that even at that time, my own um, thesis, um, Professor Rampal, was uh, about the Shah Banu case. So I, I did a little bit of, of uh, looking back at the historical, um, the, 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 the efforts to influence and sort of saffronize the Indian education system, even from the 1970s and 80s. Um, so uh, it's not something new that you have that Nehruvian paradigm coming up against a certain um, chauvinistic um, Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan kind of paradigm, uh, which is now really trying to, in many places, has taken over. So uh, that's, uh, we've lost you again. Uh, that's the, the big picture. What the, pic the, the paradigm that Professor Rampal is talking about is even another kind of paradigm. And since we've lost her, I'll take my time again. Um, this is about, um, well, I'll say this is, this is one, uh, the, the figure who's most associated with this educational paradigm is someone called Paulo Freire. Paulo Freire, if you read his work, he traveled in the villages in Brazil, and he really came to understand, he went as an educationist, he went as a kind of expert, and he understood very quickly that he did not have the expertise. Actually, the expertise was, was with all the villagers and the farmers and the people in the room. So he over the years of doing this, he learned it by practice. He, he, he didn't write the book first and then do it. He wrote the book as he was doing it. Um, he came to understand that the um, education is not something that is a one-way street. In a room, everyone is a teacher, everyone is a learner, and there is a paradigm within which we can all engage in critical thinking and we can all learn. And that is the paradigm very much that um, you, Professor Rampal, and many of the people that you work with have picked up and have tried to um, 
influence the public curriculum to try and push that way. So just to say again that we have at the very big picture level, we have these competing philosophies about what education should be. So just to re reiterate, there are four that I've mentioned. One is a traditional sort of colonial paradigm. One is an Eruvian paradigm. One is a neoliberal paradigm. And then I think we have a Freirean paradigm. So with that, I'll turn it back to uh, Shini and, and to you, Professor Rampal. <clears throat> Professor Rampal, you still have the controls. So if you want uh, to show any more slides, please uh, go ahead. Um, I would just say that, uh, you know, our people uh, really do want to know about the new education policy. So I would uh, request you to please uh, give your thoughts on that. Uh, but uh, please, you know, any slides you have uh, are welcome. Yeah, no, the... the kind of work that even translates into textbooks or the kind of work that children and classrooms are supposed to be doing where then you address issues because you know just sermonizing doesn't mean anything in education so we can't talk about all these constitutional values unless we really engage with them and engage even with the harsh realities and that's very right this is complete critical pedagogy comes from Freire's work and this is what we had worked with in our national literacy campaign in the decades of the 90s. And then when we got a chance to work at the national level in 2005, we took this work forward into working with children and uh, into working with people's knowledge, just like you had said. So a junk seller or a mason or an artisan, uh, you know, what knowledge or fish workers, what knowledge they bring with them and how uh, children uh, engage with that understanding to say that the environment is not just there to be exploited, resources are not meant to be uh, uh, consumed, but what is it that we have to look at? What does sustainable development mean? And also with young children, have a discussion. Our textbook says it, you know, so even though it went against sometimes what governments may have been doing, but the textbook said it, that whether you're building a dam or you're going deep into mining or you're doing this, these are uh, questions that have to be asked. Whose development is this? So I'm saying even our chapter on forests says whose forests for a primary child. It just doesn't say forests because it's trying to ask this question, you know, who has the right over forests, even though a land rights bill, a forest rights bill had just come in 2008 when we were writing those things. So I'm saying that raising contested issues and also asking that what is it that uh, uh, you know, a minority in terms of privileges is trying to do with the majority, uh, uh, which may be uh, disenfranchised even more in the way that development is being conducted. And this is being done in government textbooks. So for us, this is a major, uh, uh, you know, sort of space to have actually raised issues, whether it's about riots, whether it's about uh, caste and untouchability, and uh, or whether it's about what's happening under the name of development. And I want to say that today what worries, and now I come to um, the national education policy, and that's why uh, all, and today was Teacher's Day, so I'd written a piece on the legacy of past policies, you know, just remembering, and I was looking at the Radhakrishnan Commission report, which was the first education commission in 48, you know, and I looked at that and I looked at just the one before uh, independence, the Naitalim, the what does work mean? And there is a question about vocational training. So I'll link this with that understanding that this was a radical approach that we had in 1938, which in fact was trying to break away from this notion of the stigma attached to vocations, you know, the stigma of caste, which continues even today. And uh, so it was trying to say that work, the head, heart and hand and work, I mean, work is the medium of education. And productive work will be the medium of every education. And that work can mean running a dispensary in the village. It can mean running a public distribution shop for food. And that's what did. I mean, that's what children did. Hundreds of schools which were set up under Naitalim, which is called basic education. In 1950s, they were doing that, where they had land, they were growing their own food, cooking their own food. And today, the school that exists at Seva Gram, which was the ashram where Gandhi had really started a school uh, for this Naitan. And today that school still does that. You know, it was closed down, but reopened 10 years back. Still children do that. They, they grow food, 
cook it for themselves, sell it in the market, and all this is part of education. So, but vocational training, and we have had a lot of these debates in our country. Uh, the, uh, our policy till now had said, uh, and the right to education also, that uh, there will be no segregation and diversification of something more advanced, something more uh, for a more able child, something for skills. We won't have these things till grade 10. So for 15 years, uh, 16 years, all children will get equivalent education. You're not going to have different streams or tracks like we do in other countries. We do have a history of that. And after that, then there can be good uh, vocational education courses. But till date, we don't have a vocational education course. There's no education. There's zero education in those courses. They've been designed by the industry. No educationist has been involved. And uh, they have been offered to children, obviously. Uh, in the end, often children are pushed into that, saying that they don't have the ability to do a more academic course, so they should be doing that. So there's another segregation and a sorting of children. And uh, what is happening now, even in Delhi government schools, after class eight, so this policy is now talking of a restructuring of the last four years being as one part of the structure, grade 9, 10, 11, 12. And it says that it's going to offer choice and vocational courses earlier by grade 8, uh, by grade 9. But this, again, we find it very problematic because it's then pushing this age at which they're going to be uh, shunting children out. Our system never offers any choice. You know, this is only a rhetorical term. Even if children want to do some subject, they're not allowed to do it because they don't have high marks, so they're not given science, or they're not, uh, if they have high marks, they're not allowed to do social sciences because science is supposed to have higher status. So, you know, I mean, there's no question of children being given a choice. So we know that uh, this whole thing about 9, 10, 11, 12 being put together, clubbed together, is only to push children to vocational courses, which has no education. Now, uh, and the policy says that it aims to have 50% students in school in vocation education and 50% at the higher, you know, uh, higher education college level doing vocational courses. So this, again, is a very worrying prospect for us because the aspiration to come into higher education has really gone up in the last uh, five to 10 years. Uh, many more students getting enrolled, but getting enrolled only in online courses because they don't have good colleges near where they are. And uh, this policy is now pushing very strongly for online courses. I mean, during COVID, the divides that have really shown up between children other than the rural, urban, and the rich, and the poor, and the caste, and the religion, and gender, uh, is the digital divide. Because irrespective of the fact that millions of our children have had to walk back home with their parents, thousands of kilometers, you may have seen visuals of how people were suddenly a lockdown was announced and within two hours they were just, there was nothing. They had no jobs, they had no food and they were walking back. So their children walked back with them. Now in this situation, a policy comes in without any parliamentary debate that itself is shocking we need policy because, yes, our last policy was in 86. So 34 years after that, you need a policy which looks back at that policy, looks back at what was done, what was not done, why does a proper socioeconomic historical analysis, looks at the future and looks today at the kinds of, you know, the current context in which what are the challenges. But this policy most unfortunately does not do that. In two lines, it gives us uh, what happened in the past and just states in one line that there was a Right to Education Act and that's the end. There is no discussion on the Right to Education Act, which for us is a fundamental right. The policy should have been saying, why is it that it was not really implemented? And instead of that, the entire sort of next sections of elementary education contradict that act. So in fact, we want legal scrutiny of this policy by legal experts, because how can a policy override a fundamental right? So when the fundamental right says you will have good quality neighborhood school, uh, you know, and you'll have education like this with a qualified teacher, this policy says that you will have multiple pathways. You have alternative models of education, which might sound very fancy and nice, but what it is, it tells you. 
that you can go to an op open school for grade three and for grade five. Now, why should a child be doing open school? Then it says that the community volunteers will come in where there's a shortage of teacher, where there are a lot of SEDGs. So the policy shies away from talking of a word like Dalit or a word like Muslim or a word like um, a minority child or, you know, uh, it just clubs everyone under this blanket term SEDG, socio-economically disadvantaged groups. Uh, and then it says that in these areas, uh, there were more children would have dropped out. So we'll have child tutors. I mean, for us, it's really, it's dehumanizing to be thinking that of national policy you can say that a child will be made a tutor to teach other children in her school or in his school. And the draft policy in la last year had said, uh, children who are doing well will be chosen to tutor other children for six hours a week. This will be a national tutors program. I mean, the word tutoring is really bad to be <laughs> to have in a national policy because teaching and learning is not tutoring. But then to say that children will be made tutors. So, you know, it has things like that. It says there'll be village volunteers, women who haven't, who may have just done the highest level of education school that is available, but uh, they will be made to come into the school and do the early five years. So it's clubbed five years together. The first three are the Anganwaris or the early childhood care, which at some stage people felt very happy that they're taking this seriously, but they're not because it's being run by the Anganwari worker. She's not a teacher. She's not even finished her school in most cases. So she is going to look at those three years and class one and class two also have been put in here. And the whole stage is called foundational literacy and numeracy. You know, I mean, children do much more than literacy and numeracy. So by put, pulling down your expectations, allowing private schools to continue with their nurseries and KG and everything, and to have a poor child in the government system being taught by a peer tutor or a, a community a member, everything, there's centralization, which goes against the constitution. Our constitution says that education is a concurrent subject, which means that states, it's a federal structure and states make their own policy. The center cannot dictate policies. So uh, curriculum is also made by state. Recruitment rules are decided by states. And there's a central advisory board of education where all states come together and it's an advisory board, you know. But this policy now says that curriculum will be made by the central body and it will uh, decide what is the essential core national curriculum component. And then the states will sort of garnish it with local flavors and nuances. It actually uses the word local flavors and nuances, local nuances, you know, and context. So, you know, it's a kind of condescending way of saying that this is what the states will do, but the more important essential core curriculum will come from there. We know what this government is doing in terms of changing these textbooks. We know how under COVID, which was a valid uh, concern that schools have been closed for five, six months. Can you say what curriculum, how to sort of have, uh, you know, not burden children or teachers with that curriculum. But when they came out with an alternative curriculum, they had removed all the chapters, the chapter to do with constitution, the chapter to do with fundamental rights, the chapters that, you know, so all the essential chapters which were which are uh, important the chapter on people's movements uh, so all these were removed selectively professor so what does it mean so we know that what will come under the yeah no i'm just saying that the pandemic has been used uh, to just bring this out in a hurry yes and you know, not have any democratic debate yes. about it. I mean, obviously, I mean, they have they have even done away with the question hour in the parliament. So you know, forget about teachers and all that here. One uh, comment that we have, uh, Professor Rampal here, is from Jagmohan Singh ji, who is the um, nephew of uh, Bhagat Singh, Shahid Bhagat Singh. He is asking if there are copies of the books that, for instance, you showed. You know, which which talks about uh, things in a uh, in in a more realistic way there there is you know social integration and so on in it he is asking if oh yes there be, because his his concern is that these things will be destroyed given given the state of affairs you know yes. the good books yes uh, uh, one part of our struggle uh, in these in making these books was to make them freely available 
So they are all on the website. Please download the full book before it's off the website. It's on the national NCERT website. You can just say NCERT online textbooks. You can go to a class, a subject, and you can download the complete book. So please do that. And especially our social science books, our political science books are radical. Uh, you know, especially class 9, 10, 11, 12. There was a whole book on democracy, which was made only with cartoons. Uh, and uh, Yogendra Yadav was the advisor to the political science book. So some very interesting uh, work has been done, which will not remain as far as we can uh, predict. Well, let us also uh, remind people here that if you are involved in a right to education activism, you know, this is your chance to actually download those books because as Professor Rampal said, you know, you don't know when they will be taken down. So it's very good to, to go ahead and do that and keep it uh, is safe. Uh, Professor Rampal, we are very delighted today to have um, participants from all over the world. One of the participants has joined us from Ecuador. Uh, her name is Susie Prenger, and we have known her for a long time. She's a, a teacher uh, of English and has taught across the world. Um, uh, you know, we have a lot of respect for this lady. She's an activist and a teacher. She has said uh, that uh, the inequality has increased during the pandemic um, as systems move to remote teaching and learning. Connectivity is the key. Many families do not have it consistently. We also see families with one device juggling parent workload and two or three or four children trying to do school work. Now, this situation is, of course, I'm sure worse in India. So, you know, in this kind of an education yes. policy where they are talking about courses online and so on and so forth, it really is harmful for kids who forget about devices. They don't even have electricity. Yes, absolutely. That is the resistance that we have been doing right through this period. Uh, in fact, we have been saying that, uh, you know, don't, uh, I mean, there's a, a Central University of Hyderabad is one of our best universities ranked by the ministry. And they did a survey and they decided they will not have online classes. I mean, even at the university level, because they said only 20, 30 stu percent students could actually access, access because most of university students have also gone home. You know, and they don't have connectivity. My own students from Delhi University were saying that it's so expensive. You know, even a one hour Zoom session or a three hour Zoom session can take one GB data. And, you know, I'm sitting in Delhi and look at my connection. You know, it just, it can go off any time. So uh, uh, this was, a, there was major resistance at the school level. And yet governments went on, even Delhi government went on with online classes with only 20% coming, but that is not education. I mean, just staring at a board or staring at a, a screen is not education. So uh, we have tried to have lots of debates with parents. I've had sessions on the digital divide, which was attended by 15,000 uh, students and teachers in one session. So, you know, we've been doing that, talking about alternatives. We, our own organization, Bharat Gyan Vigyan Samiti, uh, in Karnataka with government teachers, with the government system and the panchayat system is running Vatare Shala, which means they're running the local school in any safe place. You know, they, they, when the infection is not really going up, they make sure it can be any safe uh, um, surrounding. Teachers come, they do activities. We told them don't bother about syllabi and don't pressurize children. There's too much anxiety that they have to face with, uh, with no jobs, with no food, with loss of livelihoods. So make sure that the midday meal, Kerala has been sending midday meal to the child's home. You know, even for young children, the teachers come, they pack the uh, food as rations and they go and deliver every week. Uh, so, you know, uh, that's what some states and some places have been doing. Mm. But overall, the push is, and that is what happened. I mean, in all this pandemic, even today, there were more than 86 and a half thousand new cases in 24 hours. Now, with this kind of a pandemic, uh, uh, you know, with people locked in, with, uh, 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 they, they have been arresting students. I mean, our best students and teachers are being arrested in the last two months with completely false charges of having done riots against Muslims, whereas these students were the ones who were helping out people struck by the riots, whatever be their religion. You yeah. know, so I'm saying that this is the state in which uh, the pandemic has been used to crush 
uh, dissent, to crust questions, to even uh, uh, silence, uh, you know, any kind of activism. So, you know, Professor Rampal, already your work was quite difficult, uh, given the various layers one has to go, <laughs> you know, to, uh, you know, in this right to education stuff, and also as, a, as an educationist in general. But these things have become even more difficult, given the pandemic. I'm going to go to uh, another issue, which I think is very important. But before the, the, I do that, I'd just like to thank a few people who are joining in from different parts of the world. Uh, you know, Shine, of course, in introduced, uh, she welcomed everyone, she's, uh, you know, from Canada. Ram Murthy ji uh, actually was one of your students or colleagues from Delhi University. Uh, he has joined Shamsul Islam from Delhi. Deepak Dholakya ji, namaste. Thanks um, uh, very much for joining from Delhi. Uh, Manjula Kumar from uh, the United States. Susie Prenger, as I've already told you. Um, uh, you know, Aradhita Chattopadhyay uh, from Ireland. Um, so Farida Dosani from, uh, from the United States, Winston D'Souza, I think from Delhi. So a lot of people are joining, Neeli Masharma from Delhi, Raghav Gakkar, uh, I think from Maharashtra. So thank you so much for joining. Um, one thing, uh, Dr. Rampal, that comes to mind when one looks at all these things, you know, these kind of autocratic way of dealing with, with everything, whether it's the content or, or changes in the system, is that uh, Liza, Liza Shri Hazarika um, has said that as we are aware that paternalistic measures are prevalent in education system. So can the paternalistic measures be justifiable in education? I would like to extend this a little further in terms of government policy being paternalistic. You know, the way things are being handled, the way things are just being given to you that you, know, you don't have a choice about. So could you please comment on that, both in terms of, I think the way they have handled things, but also in terms of content. Uh, you know, that, yes, that has sure. been introduced. Thank you so much. In fact, that's why I took those examples. I mean, and even when I took the example of forests, just the fact that with a young child, with a nine-year-old or 10-year-old child, if you can ask and discuss and say that, you know, just ma uh, making big projects or taking over or uh, completely uh, decimating forests in the name of des uh, development, is that really development and whose development is that? And, uh, you know, and after having shared the true life story of a woman from the forest and who actually goes to her school very far off, just because her uncle tells her that, you know, by schooling, you might really sharpen your agency to fight to save your forest. And she's doing that today. She's got an organization to save her forest in a tribal area in Jharkhand. So I'm saying that this is certainly, so it's, I mean, this feudal paternalistic systems in society, in education, in what goes as, uh, uh, you know, whose knowledge comes into the syllabus and whose knowledge is not considered uh, worth or valuable. All this has to be uh, grappled with, all this has to be contested. And this is what critical pedagogy or culturally responsive uh, pedagogy gives us uh, the, the scope for, gives us the approach, gives us that strength. Thank you, Professor Rampal. Um, you know, the next question that uh, we have here, which again, you know, links to one of the, the issues is the language issue. Uh, so language is another thing that the government is now, um, you know, has this great wisdom about what language we should use, what should be the language of instruction, and so on. In South Africa, where, where uh, peace vigil offices are, uh, we have had to deal with this issue in a big way in the, uh, you know, post-apartheid era. What are your thoughts on, about, uh, on, on uh, language of instruction, on you know the freedom uh, for people to take examinations in their own language. What what is all this? And you know why is Hindi being made into such a uh, such a big issue? Yeah, I just want to say that the policy tried to uh, push for Hindi, but then it immediately retracted because Tamil Nadu protested.
So uh, the, what the policy says now is not new. All our policies have said. So it's not as if this particular policy is pushing, except for just mentioning certain languages or trying to uh, talk about Sanskrit and things like that. But otherwise, in terms of uh, now, you know, in, in our work, uh, I don't like to even use the word instruction because instruction is not what we think happens. We think it's transaction and we think it's uh, learning is really a teaching and learning process. So we say the medium of learning, you know, what should be the medium of learning? And uh, um, uh, it is true that the first language that a child is speaking and the child is not just speaking, but relating to with uh, in the world around her relating with people, with nature, you know, that's the language which is allowing you to make sense of the world around you. And that language, if you start to read and write in, so your first literacy, that emergent literacy, if it's in that language, that really sort of strengthens your thought process, your feelings much more in a nuanced way. And if you then have mastery on this process, I mean, have more confidence in this process for a couple of years, the teaching of literacy in a second language is completely different. You know, so it, it, you don't go through this. It's a very different process. So uh, that's why all now understanding of teaching and learning and linguistics is saying that uh, start with the first language, whatever the first language is, uh, uh, you know, you can choose and see whether it should be the regional, the state, the language the child speaks, whatever is the best kind of way to decide uh, locally. And uh, then uh, encourage children after two, three, four years to then have the pedagogy of a second language should be different from the pedagogy of the first language. Unfortunately, in India, all languages are taught like a subject. So they're not taught like languages, you know, and that's, that's the tragedy. So in Kerala, if children can speak and think and debate in Malayalam beautifully, they couldn't write Malayalam because it was taught so badly till they actually changed their uh, entire curriculum about 15, 20 years back and made that in Uh, we seem to have lost uh, the the connection with uh, Professor Rampal again. Can people hear me though? Could you please uh, write in the chat function if you can still hear me? Uh, we seem to have Anita Ji on the on the connection, but somehow the picture and the volume is. Thank you, Aradhita. Yes, Sanjay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wonder what has happened. Thank you, Nidhi Mishra, Trilok Ji, Farida Ji, uh, Manjula Ji. Thank you for letting me know. Um, I would uh, just wait a few more minutes. Uh, she might come back as we know Delhi does experience uh, power cuts. So, um, you know, uh, as yes, she's back. Anita Ji is back. Uh, Anita ji, I'm glad we got you back. <laughs> so I was, <laughs> I was concerned we've lost. See, this, is, this is the digital, <laughs> this is the digital divide. I mean, we are sitting in privileged places True. and still it's so difficult. And I don't even know that the signal has gone because I continue to see the screen. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, you know, um, um, uh, uh, Dr. Rampal, I, ha I will go to another issue which is important. But before we do that, I just want to mention that language is, is really a huge issue that we deal with even as a peace education organization. Because, you know, the way people think, you know, the, 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 the first language that they are introduced to is, is something that is vital. Uh, to, towards making a society, you know, towards people's roles in a, in a society, towards their own understanding of self and so on. Um, and thank you for cor correcting me that, you know, it's not the medium of instruction, but medium of learning. Thank you. And that's a very important point. Uh, I hope that in, in future webinars, we deal with the, with the issue of language um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a deeper way. You know, for instance, calling English the, the mm -hmm. universal language. I mean, it, it is far from universal. Most of the world doesn't even speak English. But we, especially from South Asia, think that because we speak English, we have conquered the world. And, you know, that's not how things work. I mean, there are thousands of languages and uh, English is just in one fact, of them. 
I just want to say that my university, Delhi University, and my department uh, was one of the few departments where we had uh, we taught bilingually. I mean, we had and we had sections of students because they come from North India, many different states, to become teachers to do the teacher education course. And I have always, all the years that I taught there, I always taught the foundational courses to the Hindi medium sections. One, because I thought that that was always looked down upon. And, uh, you know, normally uh, teachers also tended to look down upon the Hindi medium students. And also no one made an effort because materials were not available. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you always had books in English, but you didn't have good materials. And I bought the kunjis, you know, those really <laughs> terrible guidebooks. I bought them initially just to see how bad, what was the stuff that my students were reading. Because only by reading them myself and then debating with them how terrible they were to get them to understand that and then to wean them off that. It was really a process. So for a year, I would wean them off depending on that terrible material, which was also communal at many places because, you know, the Hindi writers were coming from a very communal mindset at times and misinterpreting history, misinterpreting the history of education often in their own ways. So I had to do this and when I could, that was my, uh, you know, struggle that when I could wean them off this and say, when you write yourself, you write much better than this and yes. for them to understand. Yes. And eventually the way they, the students were writing from their experience because they had struggled through, I mean, many people who came to my class in Delhi University had walked through a river, crossed a river to reach their primary school with their books on their heads. That's the way they got to a school. So to have for them to have then come to Delhi University was a major battle and a major struggle. So we didn't have to read only policies. We read from people's lives yes. what this struggle for education means, you know. And, and then uh, the way they could express it hmm. in their language was so much more deep and with depth. Uh, and was so much more convincing. And my English medium students often realized it. And when they wanted to write a book review of a book that had really moved them, they would ask me, can we write in English, in Hindi? Mm. You know, even though they've never written in Hindi. So they realized what language can mean, how your sensibilities and your uh, emotions and your feelings and nuanced ways of expressing can come much better in a certain language. If you really, and that being bilingual is an advantage. And now research, brain research tells us, especially in old age, that bilingualism helps your brain to remain more active. And when I spoke to a neuroscientist uh, recently, I mean, I spoke to him when my mother was 90 and, you know, I was just saying, how do we really keep people from not getting dementia? And he said, what I do, I read in three languages every day. Wow. So that was his prescription for keeping your brain active and not getting dementia. That is amazing, uh, Professor Rampa, because, you know, I often find also having lived in the West that uh, that uh, communities from South Asia attach so much importance to just fitting in that they forget that they have all these um, knowledge, um, uh, you know, knowledges from from back. Uh, you know, from where they were born and brought up. So, you know, for instance, a person from uh, from Bengal would know Bengali, English, and, you know, perhaps even Hindi. Um, and, you know, perhaps like some some local language that uh, that we may not even have heard of. So it, it is quite beautiful to have that. Uh, but once we reach uh, countries where only one language is given importance, we kind of forget uh, that knowledge, which is uh, very sad. I think we have, um, again, um, some issues with uh, Professor Rampal's connection. I would just like to read a few comments. So Aradhita uh, has said that education actually starts at home. Even if a school would try teaching the empathy you are mentioning in their homes, it is different. It's difficult to maintain that. A state would not want critical thinking minds because it wants to keep itself at the helm of power. Certainly, that is true um, of uh, the present government uh, because, you know, right now, uh, the only thing that's keeping them in power is a, is a false uh, sense of history and um, uh, this golden age of India that they have manufactured. 
Uh, another question, uh, there, um, there is uh, actually a comment uh, that um, my mother, this is uh, again Aradhita, my mother worked as a primary school teacher in West Bengal State Board. The school had like 60, 70 students in a class. Towards the end of her career, she was asked to do these trainings. However, that was a lot of work and the teachers lost interest uh, in them. So I guess going back to the classroom, it wasn't really very successful. Um, I didn't quite get the point, Aradhita. Uh, are you saying that, you know, if, if training is, uh, is given to the teachers late, that doesn't really help, like if they have already pretty much done their uh, career in teaching? Uh, thank you. Welcome, welcome uh, Professor um, Rampal uh, and Aradhita, you can explain what, what you were saying. Uh, <laughs> this is quite... Okay. You know, this is also COVID because oh. our signal used to be perfect, but now everyone is at home and streaming. Yeah. No the, one's going out. So. Yeah. The thing is, we keep these uh, webinars late because we, we also want people from the okay. West to join. So in a way, our webinars have the best internet timing because, you know, it's later in, the, in India. It's not like yeah. at 5.30. So we generally expect it to be good, but, you know, you never know. Um, yeah, today, I don't know. It was raining or so. I, I mean, my modem shows the signals very, uh, you know, all the lines there, but yeah. the signal is unstable. <laughs> okay, but, uh, Professor Rampal, I'd like to move to, um, to the curriculum now. Uh, one question is that uh, has the curriculum become more, a uh, curriculum become more international? The second uh, question is that uh, given um, the social political agenda, this is by Marjorie Fernandez, uh, that given the social political agenda of the present government, uh, don't you think it goes against the ideals of, the, uh, of education as envisaged in the constitution or as commonly understood by democratic societies? Yes, completely. I mean, the second question is what I had started off with. So I completely agree that uh, given this current context, um, the curriculum is going to be chopped and uh, entire this whole notion of democracy is, you know, we are, we are finding that space shrinking. And also, as I said, now the centralizing, what was never allowed by the constitution in terms of education, states make their own curriculum, but now this is talking of everything centralized, including tests including tests at age grade three, five, and eight, which they say the states will take, but by the, guided by the national agency. So there are many national centralized agencies being pushed under this policy, which are problematic, including a national research fund. And uh, it is true that now they are saying that there'll be a national curriculum, what, uh, and then the states will only provide local flavor to it. So, you know, that is what is completely uh, unacceptable from an educationist point of view, too, uh, and also from a cultural, political point of view. And the first question, uh, is it more international? I will not say so. I can uh, say that that is one thing that in our country we've really uh, stuck to, we battled, even when there was a lot of funding coming from these uh, funding agencies, whether the World Bank or whether other agencies were involved. The curriculum was something that we didn't really have allowed too much. I mean, our ministry, when we say our ministry, didn't allow too much of uh, uh, involvement and interference from uh, experts coming from abroad. And so it is not really international. But yes, when you push for, and this is the neoliberal push, when you push for something like they are now saying that you push for uh, learning outcomes. Now that learning outcomes has become an international game, you know, so uh, I look at it and I've written on it uh, last year that I look at it like you're manufacturing a crisis. And so there are a lot of organizations today which work in a neoliberal, in a corpor corporate managerial sense, uh, including Central Square Foundation, Pratham, who have dug deep and really are now involved in pushing for policies. And they are the ones who are pushing for learning outcomes. So our policy now says, it says that 
uh, we will there'll be no focus on inputs but now there'll be focus only on learning outcomes so uh, you know and it's telling anyone to come and set up a school because it's saying there'll be no focus on inputs so how can you say that and learning outcomes is in our, is a is actually a discourse of denial so you're denying children the kind of learning environment which is their right a fundamental right the kind of uh, teachers they need who are really well professionally developed uh, and uh, the kind of materials resources you know everything especially a child uh, a disadvantaged child or a child the first generation child who's not getting that support at home needs much more of that but the policy says no you just look for learning outcomes through some very very meaningless kind of tests which will be done in a centralized way and uh, testing doesn't tell you uh, very much you know especially these kinds of tests but based on tests today even in delhi government in grade 3 they segregate children they label them you know one is a neo reader a non reader and the other one is talented so they are pratibha nishtha i mean children are labeled and then they know that you know uh, they i mean i have known students who quit school in grade 7 because they were put, uh, separated from their friends who went into the pratibha section which means talent and they know that whatever name you might give them they are not talented so uh, you know that is discriminatory so this notion of ability or outcomes that is being created is another hierarchy that is created to discriminate children with uh, they've got many other discriminatory uh, uh, aspects that they have to face but now they face this and now after grade 8 Uh, our best students from delhi university who are teaching in these schools have been raising their voice because now they are being told to push their children into open school mm. so you know again you make them invisible you push them in open school so their results don't spoil your or cbsc results which the governments want to show on the front page of a newspaper you know so uh, that is what is happening making pushing children out uh in whatever way making them invisible so that they don't sully your results as so as to say your outcomes mm -hmm. and the outcomes are supposed to flow out of a child's head uh, you know without giving any inputs so, so this professor, is a very damaging and this is now become an international discourse so professor you know when we talk about uh, examinations and standardized stuff that you just talked about you know we we put people in categories one of the reasons for that it, it, pe people say you know even even some of the big schools um, say that you know it's really to make sure that people get jobs or after they finish their education you know how else will be how else will we know whether somebody is ready for a certain job or is good enough for a certain job that's that's the kind of logic that is put out and one of the questions that has come is related to that uh it is by marjorie fernandez uh, who says high levels of educated unemployment in recent times has created so much of frustration and also led to the questioning of the purpose and value of education to what extent should education be considered as a means for getting a job rather than an end in itself the latter may be considered to be a luxury for the poor so i think the the issue is that you know perhaps education has been made into this uh this thing that you know that's that's only good enough for uh, for getting a job and nothing else because of the way the economy has developed you know because of neoliberal policies where you know people are going hungry uh, they're starving um so could you please explain uh, a little bit on on this subject that's true in fact when we worked during our literacy campaigns in the uh, decade of the 90s i mean we in fact debunked uh, jean dres uh, initiated a, a book called the public report on basic education and i was part of that team and we debunked this notion that you know oh well children they don't really want education they want jobs they want work first and that's why they don't come into school they go into child labor that was completely a myth and uh, we showed how and in fact the poorest wanted good quality education and they were not getting that and the poorest said that education is to make a good human being they would say ek acha insaan banega you know and that what that's what we constantly heard so these are myths that are propagated by people as i said there is this myth that even 12 year old students in a private school today are telling us why should 
these children get, read our books on science and mathematics, they should be making Golgappa or they should be, you know, getting skills like that. So I'm saying that this is the myth which is created that, uh, you know, uh, this, it's a luxury for the poor. That's not true. I mean, any meaningful education gives you that agency, gives you that confidence, give you the, gives you the ability to also, uh, you know, have confidence in your creativity and your innovation. You may, may have a lot of knowledge. A tribal child or a forest child knows much more about the forest, about the flora and fauna and about soil and nature than an urban child who I always, I take this example that the urban child has to look at a textbook to tell you how many legs does an ant have? Because an herbal child has never even played with an ant, you know. And so, but the child who knows so much is made to feel stupid in a classroom. Yeah. Through the way that the classroom is structured and through the way that the education system and the uh, curriculum forces her to, uh, you know, uh, uh, fit into that. Uh, so Professor it's Tamar, not true. Think... Any meaningful education. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's also that, uh, you know, the society that we have today uh, has a state which is not providing the basics to people. So, you know, if, you're, if you had food security, if you had good health, your main aim in life wouldn't be to earn that money that's enough to feed you for that day. So you would actually look at education as something that improves your mind, you know, that opens up your mind to other, other things, you know, to the world, to other experiences. But because of the way the state is, is functioning today, which, is, uh, which doesn't care about people's basic needs, uh, I think more and more parents are thinking in terms of, okay, you know, is this going to make uh, uh, it possible for my child uh, to be able to feed herself or That's himself. true, but what I'm trying to say is that the poorest is not saying this. I see. The poorest is asking for a good quality functioning school. The poorest person is not saying that I, I want to fill my stomach first and not have education. They're, they're staying hungry to get education for their child. I see. So this is a myth that the middle class creates. And right now, of course, there's no employment. Where is their employment, you know, that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, that even uh, people can aspire for. People have taken exams, taken uh, exams two years back, and still those results have not been declared. So there have been promises of a million jobs with no jobs coming. Yeah. So I, it's true that the state is, has not functioned, but I'm saying trying to put it on education and say as if education is the only thing which is making so this whole notion of unemployable and things like that mm -hmm. uh, you know I, I i mean we are saying that yes we need a better system a better functioning a more meaningful education for mm -hmm. that we need good teachers mm -hmm. where are those teachers our schools are short of teachers and our policy doesn't have a word to say on teacher education mm -hmm. and our policy says that philanthropic public partnerships so it's trying to piously avoid the word private even though we all know that ppp is public private partnership but first of all shying from the word private because you want to say that yes education is not for profit which is right it is not and our law says that but our teacher education is in the hands of 95 percent it's in the hand of the private sector and uh, uh, we have had commissions which have legal commissions law commissions which have said hundreds of these colleges should be closed down because they're teaching shops, they're commercialized, they have no quality, and why are they allowed to run? But still they're running, they're, they're, they're profiting and proliferating. You know, so uh, on the one hand, that has not been checked. And on the other hand, there is no investment in teacher education in terms of public systems of education. Yeah. Uh, and so then how can a policy say we'll have many more private philanthropic players coming into the system? So mm -hmm. what does this mean? This is completely inconsistent with the ground also, realities. Also, the so-called philanthropic institutions, their agendas may be very communal or casteist or whatever, and we yes. don't know uh, what, what they're yes. going to be teaching. In fact, uh, I was on a panel with uh, a, a, a chairperson from the open school, and uh, the chairperson was telling us when we were talking about school quality and the indices that have been developed on school quality, he said that uh, the best schools are the Ekal Vidyalas uh, because they're all enrolled under open school because they don't comply with the requirements of a board 
and these are all right-wing organizations and there are hundreds and thousands of them you know so he and he was trying to tell me they can run under a tree they can run anywhere they don't even ask for a building they have a single teacher ekal means solitary teacher so i'm just saying that the policy is quiet about this but when it's saying that the rte is too restrictive or oh, we have to open loosen this restrictions and it's saying a gurukul is fine a madrasa is fine that's what the policy is saying. that you know all these will be multiple modes and will be alternative modes of education including the open school the open school is convenient for all those systems which are not complying with even the requirements of affiliation to a board and that's where they are going because there is uh, there's nothing that will uh, that will tell them that look look you you are not complying with with these government yeah. measures yeah so there is no regulatory mechanism and then you can run a most communal system i mean like the policy says a gurukul is acceptable a madrasa is acceptable but it's not saying that it's own ekal vidyalayas are the largest in number in the country well, and the that this will also then allow them to function yeah the next thing we'll hear is that rss shakhas are the the official schools you know <laughs> yeah so <laughs> this continues certainly i mean uh, it, that they have saraswati shishu mandirs which is a very huge body of schools true um, and run by cadres that's why you you don't need a regular you, you need a teacher who's a volunteer who can come with very low salaries also true the order comes that's why they're saying we don't need the building we don't need anything yeah i, I you know that's that's another uh, issue where the government doesn't want to do anything so a, a, everyone else is invited to do things but then those people who are coming in have their own agendas so the state is not uh, uh, fulfilling yeah. its its commitments that it's required to fulfill under the indian constitution uh professor rampal i'd like and if you look at the policy once i just yeah, i just say one thing uh if you look at the policy one thing that's most striking uh someone spoke about constitution uh, that it never really i mean whenever it talks of constitutional values it prefaces it with something called ethical and human values and those contain things like uh, respect for public property or cleanliness or uh, um, courtesy and out of a 30 a list of 30 values the last one is equality and justice oh my god can you believe this so it's always trying to sideline the constitutional values by putting in all kinds of mundane things before that you know and pu- pushing equality and justice to the end whenever you see this in the policy you'll find this and secularism is never there uh, that is very frightening uh, especially now that you know they are even trying to do away with the, with the whole system of elections in some ways by declaring that you know they'll always be in power so you know uh, education is is perhaps one of those areas that uh, that you know will will influence not perhaps but it is that area that influences not only people today but you know 10 years from now 15 years 20 years from now uh, it's it's a it's it's a very important thing uh professor rampal uh if you can hear me you, i can see that you're still connected so i hope you can hear me uh i want to uh come to the question of privatization of education uh in a in a little more detail if you could please talk to us about it there are uh, several questions on it uh there are coming to us uh there are also people writing on whatsapp to us um i did mention earlier that if you have questions please uh join zoom but i guess some people have difficulty doing that so they are sending questions by whatsapp um so unfortunately oh we have lost uh dr rampal again i'm i'm sorry um let us hope that uh, she can join us again this time um we have about half an hour before we have to close the webinar uh i appreciate uh, a lot of comments and questions that are coming in i'm not sure if we'll be able to take all of them but as always you are welcome to write to our email address which is uh, been given here i'm i'm going to show it to you again Uh, or you can write it down i'm i'm putting it in the in the chat function for everyone to see um it is shireen it is shireen 
at peacevigil.net. So, um, you know, if you have any questions for Dr. Rampal in case she's unable to join. Oh, she's, she's here. But in case you have, <laughs> you can send. I, I almost, I almost feel like some, you know, some <laughs> ghost who suddenly appears and suddenly disappears. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Dr. Rampal, there are two very pressing questions that we'd like uh, your input on. One is the privatization of education. So, uh, yes, of course, you've already talked about the philanthropic, uh, you yeah. know, these things that, but like in terms of profit and how they're also going to churn out this workforce that Sami was talking about earlier you know, uh, without giving them the, the critical thinking skills where they can look at issues uh, from the perspective that you mentioned earlier, you know, justice and injustice, uh, you know, oppression and uh, so on. So that is one, the privatization issue. The second issue is, uh, which many people are asking about, is the curriculum itself. So I know you gave examples where, for instance, you, you, sh or you showed women or girls, you know, doing things that are generally considered male dominated or, you know, only, only reserved for men. Uh, you also are giving examples of names that reflect the diversity of India. So those little, little things. Uh, we, we heard, for instance, uh, examples from Gujarat textbooks, which is before uh, the central government came um, into BJP's hands that there were mathematics books there that were completely communal in, in the problems that, that were given and so on. Uh, certain chapters were completely removed. Uh, so both those issues, please. And uh, uh, Dr. Rampal, you have, uh, we, we still have about half an hour, but because there are a lot of questions, I just want to mention that we have about half an hour to conclude now. Thank you. Yeah. Uh... So um, this question about, uh, you know, the, the communalization or how states have been do, uh, tampering with curricula, we've seen this in the last few years. You said in Gujarat, Rajasthan also, uh, the textbooks were made this way, very, very, uh, uh, you know, problematic in terms of what they decide, especially in the social sciences. We know how history is contested, but even otherwise. So uh, that problem does remain. And right now, in the last five years, we've not had, uh, at the national level, we've not had that as much, though we've constantly heard uh, some things were being removed. But now they're coming up with a national curriculum framework, 2021, and textbooks, they're saying, uh, following uh, one or two years after that. So uh, there, there, of course, just as I said, even on the pretext of COVID, they, can, they could remove the most crucial chapters just because they said we, there's shortage of time. They removed the chapter on constitution or human rights and, you know, on uh, environmental degradation. I mean, they chose exactly what they thought was inconvenient. Uh, and especially after the citizenship, the protests about the anti-citizenship, uh, uh, I mean, the law that has come in. And uh, so, you know, all these chapters were rem removed. So that is something that we will have to contend, contend with. And uh, I think these debates will have to go on and uh, people will have to look at what's coming next and taking up these issues. Uh, what was the second question, uh, Shirin? Uh, Shirin was- uh, The privatization. Yeah, yes. Privatization and for-profit. The private, yeah, yeah, the for-profit, yes. So even though the law continues to be not for profit in education, but we know, as I was mentioning, that um, most of these, including schools and universities and colleges are for profit, they're commercial, uh, and they, are, they can be completely substandard also. So uh, this is something that the regulatory mechanism has not looked at, and this policy promises an even more diluted and loose regulatory system. So uh, when it says, especially for schools, but uh, so that will be worrying and uh, we'll have to, uh, you know, try and see not just that, but a lot of private universities have come in, which uh, people are joining because they think that they have some good academics and some good courses, but the fee is exorbitant. 
So it's such an exclusive environment. I know some friends who after retirement from a public university joined there because they thought it was exciting to design a new course, but it's such an exclusive batch of such a slice of the population because it's exorbitant fee. None of us would have been able to afford it during our times of college education. So it is true that plus the foreign universities that are being in, uh, encouraged in the current policy will again then uh, play, put a dent on the, on the resources in terms of people who are teaching. They will get attracted to that. I mean, even now we know universities are attracting people because of the three times, five times higher salary that they might give. So uh, it is true that uh, that will have an influence of what shape our public universities take. Um, and schools, of course, yeah. schools, of course, we know that uh, because uh, the public system doesn't really get its act together, get teachers, uh, enough teachers, and in fact keeps allowing these schools also because you get permissions. You give permissions to public governments, private schools to open. So this game continues. And then you say, well, oh, it's opening because they want English medium. So you make your own government schools into English medium overnight. Yeah. So, you know, without trying, I mean, like now in Andhra, they're doing, uh, in Chhattisgarh, they did. In Jammu and Kashmir, they did. Overnight, they declared all our government schools are English medium. So this kind of, uh, you know, a game is going to go on and this is problematic. And now technologies are coming in in a very big way mm -hmm. and a very damaging way. I know I've attended some seminars where new startups, very excited, have come young people with no idea of education, come with the slogan that they're democratizing education because they're providing it on a tablet without knowing how damaging that is, without knowing how the algorithms themselves are biased and just thinking that you're going to customize an algorithm for a child, a poor child, and you know, think that you've democratized education is so, so completely off the point of the mark. But Niti Aarog is pushing for that. This policy is talking about artificial intelligence and is saying that all assessments, even in pri primary school, will be shifted to algorithmic assessments as soon as there'll be a device in the hand of every teacher and child. And we know that there are these kind of bridge academies which have entered India, which were thrown out of other countries earlier, which have the model in which you just need a tablet. A child has a tablet and a teacher has a tablet. The teacher is not a teacher. It's a volunteer, doesn't know much, but everything is programmed. Mm -hmm. So the child just has programmed worksheets to do and depending on one worksheet, the next one appears, depending on how well or how badly you did that. Mm -hmm. So that programming itself is not education. It's very damaging, but that is coming. Well, everything seems to be uh, in favor of programming when it comes to this government. I mean, we have the EVMs, you know, everything is digital, you know, the government yeah. runs on Twitter, you know, so all these things, they are not inconsistent. So education is not inconsistent with that policy. Um, uh, and there is surveillance. And there is surveillance. Yes. A lot of private data is being taken up. Teachers in Delhi government schools have CCTVs. From the first budget of a small uh, a thousand schools uh, system, Delhi government has only 1,100 schools. They had kept 100 crores of rupees just for CCTVs, closed circuit televisions in every classroom. The teachers are being watched. And then the parents are promised that they'll get broadcast of the classroom onto their phones. A complete surveillance system is being pushed in with technologies. So we can see where we are going. And, uh, you know, in terms of the privatization of education, there is a comment from Gujarat uh, by uh, Trilok Achare, who says that there's no limit of fee uh, in the fee structure in privatization of education. It's a major problem. So he's, he's writing from, uh, from Gujarat, uh, where the privatization of education is going on in a, in a pretty uh, big way. Um, there is a question about exams, ma'am which is that um, uh, it's by Pooja Sharma. She's asking, uh, NTA has conducted various exams, like various entrance exams, NEET, NET, and so on. So ma'am, according to you, in this pandemic, the conduction of exams, is, this, uh, is it appropriate or not? No. In this pandemic, certainly not. 
uh, and especially when students are not able to travel, there is no public transport, there is no safe way for them to reach. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, you're pushing out a lot of students who just cannot reach your centers or they pay through their nose to get some private taxi. So this was uh, completely not called for and at the behest of students who said that this is discriminatory because many of them, others will have a car to take them safely to the uh, place because the, even for the IIT, the IIT director was sitting on a TV channel and saying, we'll conduct it in, through all the protocols of a very safe exam without bothering of how the student will reach the exam center. There's students who had to go 500 kilometers to reach a center. So this was, again, I think, uh, very undemocratic because uh, there were seven states who said they shouldn't do this. There were hundreds and thousands of students who were saying, don't do this, postpone it, but don't do it right now. So, for example, uh, the, uh, the same um, uh, uh, participant, Pooja Sharma, has mentioned Jammu and Kashmir. She's saying that there is only 2G there uh, for the last six months. Yeah. So there is yeah. no way that the students can actually uh, do all these things online. Uh, it's just True. not possible. So that's again True. where, I mean, where the oh, difference uh, in people's uh, access come, you know, is so apparent. Completely. I mean, Kashmir is another story. I mean, so I, it's not just 2G. Mm -hmm. I mean, what has been done by, uh, you know, actually taking a state taking statehood away and making union territories deliberately humiliating a whole uh, you know group a uh, whole state and uh, putting people elected representatives into prison for six months till they are lying in prison i mean kashmir is another story so let's not even compare it with uh, not having a, with a 3g or 4g it's true uh, what they have been through here, people, we know what lockdown meant, but they kept reminding us that they didn't have any communication. So that was a completely different story. Yeah, I, I uh, must tell the... I mean, that was a violation of rights of many kinds. Yeah, true. true. Uh, I must say that, um, you know, I'm very proud of the questions that are coming because, uh, Professor Rampal, these are not your typical activists, you know, who join our webinars. These are many of them young, but also older people who have become interested in these issues over the last few years because they've seen things are not going well and they're trying to learn. So I'm, I'm very happy that these questions are coming. Um, one uh, thing that I'd like to mention to our audience here is that Dr. Anita Rampal, along with a few other people, uh, have been working on good education for all for a very long time, before even right to education was a thing. Um, and uh, when I say very long time, it's like, you know, 40 years or so. Uh, I have seen them personally work in villages, uh, trying to develop uh, a system that will be function, uh, fu uh, you know, will will be able to function in areas where there is very little uh, uh, pool of money, for example, available. So you know, uh, you guys have a great resource person today uh, to talk about this uh, in a long process that she has been involved with. It's not something new to her. She has been doing this before governments even thought about it. So thank you, Dr. Rampal, and thank you. Uh, to all the participants. I will go on to um, a, a question that is uh, technical here. Aradhita is asking from Ireland. In the last draft I saw, there were tax exemptions for the corporates if they spent 0.1% of their share for education. Is it still there? Uh, I, I do not recall uh, this because uh, you know, what we have found is that in terms of the financial aspects, it's been very weak. It's not really spelled out. And they're just very blanket statements, you know, like last minute, it was said, yes, 6% of GDP will be devoted to education, which no one believes in. Uh, so I didn't check on this, but uh, we have seen that corporate social responsibility, the funds which corporates have been given to health and education, have now all been attracted under the PM Cares Fund. There have been hundreds of thousands of, uh, you know, millions of rupees that have gone in uh, to that fund. And that is under question because 
a right to information people are trying to get some information on that and uh, they say that you cannot get information and that will not be audited and they're claiming it's a private trust but it's not it's been set up by government secretaries and i mean th those are people ex officio uh, on that trust so this people who are working with corporate social responsibility on the field and they know they're saying that that is drying up uh, that is not now coming for education which it did last year because that has been sucked up by the government by coercion or by in whatever way and that has gone under this a large uh, blanket uh, funding for COVID, which is uh, uh, not transparent. True. I'm going to skip some of the comments just because of lack of time. I apologize to people who are commenting or, you know, have observations. I'm going only to questions and I may even skip a few questions if I see an overlap. So sorry, I'm, I'm going to do that in the interest of time. And I know it's late for Professor Rampal and for all our participants from India. But I do appreciate everyone's patience despite the technical glitches we had. Uh, Manjula Kumar from uh, the United States is asking how the government policy is different from the private school policies, if there is a, 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 a blanket policy, you know, when it comes to private schools. And how is this influencing social change? I'm not sure if I understand the question. I, there, is no, there is no private, no, there is no private school policy. A policy is for all schools. It's just how it gets implemented. There is no private school policy that we have, except for the fact that I'm saying uh, states might cap the fees, states might have some regulatory mechanisms, uh, but there is no policy for that, a okay. separate policy for that. Raghav Gakhar from India. It's just that this, this policy is encouraging a lot of private players and a lot of questionable substandard private players to come in and open schools, and that will really damage uh, hmm. this whole process of social change towards equity, towards empathy, towards trying to get people together and towards quality. So I think perhaps that's what Manjula Ji was referring to, you know, that, you know, private schools have their own uh, whatever they want to follow, um, yeah. which, which shouldn't be the case. Uh, Raghav Gakhar from India is asking, do we encourage entrepreneurship in our schools? What do you think about the coaching institutes which start coaching for IITs from 6th or 9th? So I think there are two questions there. Yeah, entrepreneurship uh, uh, in terms of, that's what I started with the idea of Nai Talim, which was work, not vocation. And every child must have an education which is integrated, you know, in terms of productive work, doing something with the community, feeling an transformative agency of the child that you know you're doing something uh, productive and entrepreneurship is should be a part of that not separately in terms of your job and your vocation and your enterprise later so that is part and even this chapter that i showed you kiran the junk seller true story she did that on her own mm -hmm. and we brought it as a chapter in a maths textbook so that is the idea that you know what does it mean we brought in uh, examples, true examples of women who normally never went fishing, they were not allowed to, uh, in, even in the fish workers community, and how they set up a bank, they set up a, uh, their own uh, uh, cooperative, they got a loan, they bought a boat, and they started fishing, and they've set up a fish drying industry. Wow. As a, it's a true example, and we're giving that as a mathematics chapter. So mm -hmm. this is something that is important if it's done creatively and through more li living examples, which are also inspiring, but uh, um, not in terms of saying that I'm now teaching you a vocation or you're now learning how to uh, set up an enterprise, certainly not up to grade 10. After grade 10, grade 11, 12, they can be more creative, innovative courses, which do that. Um, uh, Dr. Rampal, there, I know that you have always found creative ways, you just mentioned creativity, you have always encouraged the use of song and drama and so on in, in teaching. And there's a question um, from Washington DC uh, that, you know, teaching about the arts and through the arts, how much of that is, is used in the Indian education system? I know you do it, uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it has not been used. And in fact, the last national curriculum framework in 2005 explicitly stated that there, is no, there should be nothing which is co-curricular or extracurricular. Everything should be curricular in which uh, arts and theater and everything should be equally built in. And that's why, as I said, we have, uh, even in the primary curriculum, uh, it is all there. There is uh, your understanding, you're looking at heritage, you're looking at masonry, you're looking at brick masonry and jaroka and the way uh, masons have traditionally made this. And you're not talking of a cuboid, you're looking at a brick, you know, so that's the way we're doing it and uh, integrating all these things in what you learn, we, in, even in subjects which are considered completely sort of dehumanized, decontextualized away from life. Uh, so, but uh, even in our teacher education program, which is run by Delhi University, especially uh, a four year program that we've been running and which really runs well uh, straight after school, we've been doing this for almost 20 years, the Bachelor of Elementary Education, their uh, theater, I mean, uh, drama in education is a compulsory component. Mm. So we look at drama not for acting, but drama which makes teachers give, it's like a medium which allows teachers and students to transcend space and time, to imagine another person's life, to interrogate uh, someone from a completely different universe or someone from five centuries earlier and you want to know why she did something and how, what were the conditions to allow you to imagine beyond the everyday today. So that is a tool and that is a very, you know, so to use drama in education. And now I was the chair for the new two year B.Ed program. And I also brought that as a compulsory component for every teacher being trained to understand how drama in education helps to, uh, uh, to really, uh, transact the teaching and learning process much more sensitively. Uh, Professor Rampal, I will only have uh, two more questions. Now I'm, I'm, I will have to stop uh, with the question answers because I would like you to spend a few minutes telling us about the good examples we have from the world, uh, you know, that we can perhaps try and, and work towards. So one question by Tariq Bashir is, why our curriculum do not give any importance to blind students as I am myself blind? What to do? Yes, that's true. Uh, uh, even though education departments is probably the only department which actually keeps uh, some seats for uh, visually challenged students, and uh, you know to uh, get them to become teachers but it's true there is uh, a no no uh, uh, provision there's no special help there's no way to understand how communication should be made even with a student who's visually challenged and how teachers can actually conduct a class of uh, you know uh, sighted students so uh, it is very nominal i mean the fact that there is space for people to come in and uh, uh, to have this kind of an opportunity to be teachers. Uh, the I'm uh, afraid there is some connectivity problem. I was going to take one more uh, question. I'll just wait a couple of seconds uh, before we go to um, the conclusion if we do not connect with uh, Professor Rampal. Uh, the the um, reason I want to spend the last few minutes talking about good examples is because Peace Vigil is all about hope, about inspiration, and uh, we must look at not just uh, the countries we reside in, but also across borders, uh, learn from others, see where things are working. Uh, Susie, for instance, is saying here that uh, what the Indian situation is, is exactly what is happening in Ecuador as well. And I'm afraid also she's saying in her uh, in, in the United States, uh, which is her uh, home country. Uh, so there are uh, examples that we can see from all over the world, which are similar, 
in 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 terms of pain you know whether it is privatization it is corporate corporatization of of educational institutions also the right wing um, uh, agenda in terms of content and controlling of schools uh, and so on but there are also good examples from the world in the package we had sent out to our participants we had included an example from finland uh, where Michael Moore had um, made, I think the one we sent uh, to you was uh, a, a short documentary made by Michael Moore. But you can do your own research also and find examples from around the world. Um, uh, I am afraid that um, it doesn't look like Professor Rampal uh, is going to be able to join again. If she does, we will um, perhaps, you know, ask her to comment on the good examples. But uh, in the meantime, I would like uh, Samir Dosani, my colleague, to wrap up this discussion, which has been very insightful, uh, but so that we remember the, the main points that have been raised. Thank you, uh, Samir. Thank you so much, Shirin. Um, what an amazing discussion. Despite the technical challenges, it really has been um, such an eye-opener on so many levels. And I'd like to thank our, our distinguished guest, uh, Dr. Anita Rampal. Um, and I'd also like to thank Shirin for the lovely, for the, for the interview and for the challenging questions. Um, listen, I think there's so many things to say. I, I, I'm not gonna try to wrap up this conversation because there are too many things to say. But I think that um, what, what, to me, what is coming out the most from this discussion is this question of what is education? First of all, it's, it's a public good. Uh, and when it's anything that's a public good, if, if it's failing, if it's not doing what it's supposed to do, in my view, that is a failure of democracy, right? Um, and so, but to some extent, a failure of democracy is a failure of all of us, right? The people are not engaged in a way that is um, helpful, as it were. So if that's the case, we can ask, okay, what is the competing philosophy of education that we can say that we are, we are debating? What is this debate really about? And I would say it's not just about education, it's about society. What kind of people are we uh, as a society or as India, Indian society trying to produce? And I think there is one view that says we are trying to provide, provide um, our society with effective workers for corporates, right? That is sort of the, the mainstream or maybe the progressive view, right? And then there is, in opposition to that, there is a right-wing view, a Hindu nationalist view, which is that we are trying to produce Hindu nationalists, basically. We're trying to produce people who will identify with the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sang and implement the BJP agenda. Uh, and I think you can see elements of both of these paradigms within the current national education policy that's being debated. But what struck me the most from what Professor Rampal said was that when she, uh, in her field work, when she asks people from poor communities, what is the purpose of education? They don't talk about jobs. They certainly don't talk about Hindu nationalism. They talk about we are, we are supposed to become, through education, we're meant to become good people. Um, and to me, that really is, is the key here. So if we believe that, and I think we all should, I think that taking the cue from people who um, are the most affected by these bad policies and who say that we uh, that is really the key. Um, so sorry, uh, Professor Rampal, I'm, I'm wrapping up with uh, just quoting yes. some of your own words. Um, but maybe before I, 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 I say my very last word, if there's anything you wanted to add, we were specifically curious about the case of, fin uh, of Finland or any other uh, educational system that you think we should aspire to. If you could maybe say a word about that and then I'll, I'll continue. Yeah, uh, Professor Rampal, a couple of good examples that, so that we leave uh, participants with hope and inspiration. I, I think that, uh, am I still there? I yeah, know. Ah, okay, I think that, uh, I mean, we have had a couple of good examples ourselves. I mean, that's what's kept us going and that's how we reach the, with the kind of examples that I showed you. But yes, across the world, uh, in the last one or two years, I have had the chance to actually be invited 
uh, and to see how these systems work. And I think that uh, Finland, uh, even though it is talked a lot because of its ranking in the international chess, but uh, what has been really interesting is the way they've gone about it. And I happen to meet people who worked on it for 10, 15 years. They thought that they should have a curriculum which really promoted social harmony, not have exams focused on uh, you know, children being engaged together. Uh, so I think that is something that is still very useful because I saw today uh, they, the best teachers in the government schools are given to students who are coming as immigrants uh, from different countries, from poor countries. And these teachers spend time with them so that they can take up to a year to even then fully uh, 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 join the uh, class that they they according to their age and uh, the kind I saw these systems the way teachers teach them so I think that and they tell me that now the uh, OECD which is now trying to praise them for all the good performances that they do actually is trying to push their policies in the wrong direction you know and that's what's happening to Sweden also yeah, they're really pushing them in a neoliberal way saying don't have these uh, smaller classes, you should have bigger classes and, you know, do this and do that for teaching. But their teacher education is good. So what's fascinating is that the students who do very well in school, the first thing they want to do is become a teacher. That's their first choice. For us, it's a dream. You know, when will we be able to reach that stage when it's really a circle of working through an inspiring and a more challenging task and people want to do education because they think it's very meaningful for them. Fantastic, thanks so much. And I think, I think in the Indian context, it, it's just important to stress, the, the Finland example is too complicated to give a detailed analysis, but just to stress that this is a system that does not emphasize competition, does not emphasize testing. Um, yeah. it, it's, in fact, you can go through the entire system without even knowing you know, if you're the better student or the worst student in the class or whatever it may be, um, or at least until I believe grade, grade nine or grade 10 uh, when they do introduce grades and so on. So it's a very- And teachers are given a lot of freedom, yeah. The teachers are given freedom and the, the principle is that um, yeah. non-competitive, co cooperation and non-competitiveness are sort of founding principles up until a very advanced uh, yeah. age. Uh, uh, Professor Rampal, just one more thing which I, I think should be mentioned. I know we are running out of time, but uh, you work um, on the subject of education for sustainable development. I'd like you to please mention uh, you know, a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm working with the teacher education faculty in Switzerland. Uh, they asked me to join them because they said they, uh, when they work on sustainable development from their context, it only seems like uh, less consume less you know that's all i mean it's on it's based on consumption but they want to have a to, their own teacher this is a masters of education program so we develop this together and we get students teachers from there they actually some of them are teachers and we first go and i take them to sevagram and to the nait alim school and they try and understand that in in our context sustainable development is not just linked to consumption, but it's livelihood, it's life and death. And uh, what does it mean uh, to be understanding that and to address uh, anything? If they're doing, a, they develop a chapter on cotton or they develop, and then they then try to even critically look at their own system. Uh, so what does it mean? You know, any product that they're making, most of them are coming from outside. Where are they coming? who are producing them at what cost and under what conditions. So that really gives them a much deeper understanding about models of development and what really would be more sustainable and how to understand that. So uh, it, is, it has been in the last two, three years, a very interesting program. And we have shared with them trying to do things together and work how we can have something in a school classroom. They were amazed by the questions that the Naita Alim students asked them. They thought they came with a very simplistic introduction to Switzerland, uh, but they were amazed at the deep questions asked by children. And then when I have spent time with them, I have uh, asked to be get, given the opportunity and I spent uh, a lot of time to understand their vocational education system, because I think that is something which is extremely weak in our context and we really need to understand better what they're doing and what we need to do.
Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Professor Rampal. This is, a, as I said, uh, what you were offline, unfortunately. This has really been a tour de force. You've taken us through some of the basic principles of right to education. Uh, you've taken us through some of the critiques. Of course, it's a long document, the NEP, um, but some of the main concerns around the NEP. Um, and I think you've also shared your experience from the field, uh, which is what I was sharing when you, when you rejoined, which is that really the purpose of education, as we heard from people who are the most affected by these policies, the, the poorest people, they are saying that the purpose of education is to become a good human being. And I think uh, for us, we need to engage a little bit with the question of what that means. We need to engage with it, that question in the context of the current policy, but also in general, in our lives, in our schools, wherever we live, in public education systems especially, um, also in private education systems if that's where we happen to be. But I think trying to, even if you are in private, trying to play a role in the public debate uh, as a matter of social responsibility is also very important. Um, critical thinking is something that's come up, an analysis and the ability to, um, to think freely. Um, and I just wanted to mention that we have uh, interviews on our site. Uh, you can go to our YouTube channel, look for the, um, the Peace Vigil logo there you see on the left. Um, and you'll see interviews with uh, JNU professors who talked about what happened there um, in December and January of, of uh, last year and this year. Um, JNU is one of the institutions that was really under attack, uh, in part because they encouraged the critical thinking, uh, but in part also because I think it's a, seen as a good institution um, and they're trying to make it less accessible. One of the institutions where people of different classes did mingle, could mingle, and castes and, and religions and so on. And I think this was really seen as a threat um, by some of the communal forces. Uh, so I would urge you to, I'd urge our listeners to go and check out uh, some of those interviews, as well as other interviews. This is the first of a series of webinars we'll be doing on education. The next one uh, will be a week from today featuring N N Nadima Jogi, who is a South African educationist uh, who's worked with Neville Alexander and some of the, uh, the other noted educationists here. Uh, please do go to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, and if you have any questions, feel free to write to us at the email address here. Uh, Professor Anita Rampal, it's really been a pleasure. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Thank you and good night. Good night. It's been really a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you. Hopefully we'll do it again.